think there's some direct similarities between what I'm about to read from you and also a short poem and what Rousseau said. And this is titled, Alone. From childhood's hour, I have not been as others were. I have not seen as others saw. I could not bring my passions from a common spring. From the same source, I have not taken my sorrow. I could not awaken my heart to joy at the same tone. And all I loved, I loved alone. Then in my childhood, in the dawn of a most stormy life, was drawn from every depth of good and ill the mystery which binds me still. From the lightning in the sky, as it passes me flying by, from the thunder and the storm, and the cloud that took the form when the rest of heaven was blue, of a demon in my view. Anyway, having heard alone, we may have a greater comprehension for another poem by Poe that was Edgar Allan Poe that wrote that, which uh, we should all know and which I would, if you don't mind, like to do for you now. The Raven. Is that okay? We can do this? Okay. It's a poem. But have we all heard it? That's the question. Um, and the, and the, the key, a couple of keys in here is the number of emotions, the sequence of emotions that uh, that he goes through. The other thing is the virtual uh, absence of human action. I mean, the, the main character opens a door, opens a window, moves a chair, and that's about all he does, other than go inward and recount what's going on inside of him. And that, to me, is the key. Oh, and by the that three-character thing is important. There's one obvious character, uh, but the narrator is also the main actor. So don't get confused because he will change roles in mid, mid, uh, midstream. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, while I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. Tis some visitor, I muttered, tapping at my chamber door. Only this and nothing more. Ah, distinctly, I remember it was in the bleak December and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly, I wished the morrow Vainly I had sought to borrow from my book surcease of sorrow, sorrow for the lost Lenore, for the rare and radiant maiden whom the angels named Lenore, nameless here forevermore. And the silken, sad, uncertain rustling of each purple curtain thrilled me, filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before. So the tower to still the beating of my heart I stood repeating. Tis some visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door. Some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door. This it is and nothing more. Presently, my soul grew stronger, hesitating then no longer. Sir, said I, or madam, truly, your forgiveness I implore. But the fact is, I was napping, and so gently you came tapping, and so faintly you came rapping, rapping at my chamber door, that I scarce was sure I heard you. Here I open wide the door, darkness there, and nothing more. Deep into that darkness peering. Long I stood there, wondering, fearing, doubting, dreaming dreams no mortal ever dared to dream before. But the silence was unbroken, and the darkness gave no token, and the only word there spoken was the whispered word, Lenore. This I whispered, and an echo murmured back the word, Lenore. Merely this and nothing more. Back into my chamber turning, all my soul within me burning. Soon again I heard a tapping, somewhat louder than before. 
Surely, said I, surely that is something at my window lattice. Let me see then what thereat is, and this mystery explore. Let my heart be still a moment, and this mystery explore. Tis the wind, and nothing more. Open then, I flung the shutter, when with many a flirt and flutter in there stepped the stately raven of the saintly days of yore, not the least obeisance made he, not an instant stopped or stayed he, but with mien of lord or lady, perched above my chamber door, perched upon a bust of talus, just above my chamber door, perched and sat, and nothing more. Then this ebony bird beguiling, my sad fancy into smiling, by the grave and stern decorum of the countenance it wore, Though thy crest be shorn and shaven, thou, I said, art sure no craven, ghastly, grim, and ancient raven, wandering from the nightly shore. Tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's Plutonian shore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Much I marveled this ungainly fowl to hear discourse so plainly, though its answer little meaning, little relevancy bore, for we cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing bird above his chamber door, bird or beast upon the sculptured bust above his chamber door with such name as nevermore. But the raven sitting lonely, on the placid bust spoke only that one word as if his soul in that one word he did outpour. Nothing further than he uttered, not a feather than he fluttered, till I scarcely more than muttered. Other friends have flown before. On the morrow he will leave me as my hopes have gone before. Then the bird said, never more. Startled at the stillness broken by reply so aptly spoken, doubtless said I, what it utters is its only stock and store caught from some unhappy master whom unmerciful disaster followed fast and followed faster till his songs one burden bore, till the dirges of his hope that melancholy burden bore of nevermore, nevermore. But the raven still beguiling, all my sad soul into smiling. Straight I wheeled a cushioned seat in front of bird and bust and door. Then upon the velvet sinking, I betook myself to linking fancy under fancy, thinking what this ominous bird of yore, what this grim, ungainly, ghastly, gaunt, and ominous bird of yore meant in croaking nevermore. This I sat, engaged in guessing, but no syllable expressing to the fowl whose fiery eyes now burned into my bosom's core. This and more I sat divining, with my head at ease reclining, on the cushion's velvet lining that the lamplight gloated o'er, but whose velvet violet lining with the lamplight gloating o'er, she shall press. Ah, never more. Then methought the air grew denser, perfumed from an unseen censer, swung by seraphim whose footfalls tinkled on the tufted floor. Wretch, I cried, thy God hath lent thee, by these angels he has sent thee, respite, respite, and nepenthe thee from thy memories of Lenore. Quaff, oh, quaff this kind nepenthe and Forget the lost Lenore, quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, by that heaven that bends above us, by that God we both adore, tell this soul with sorrow laden, if within the distant Aden it shall clasp a sainted maiden whom the angels named Lenore. Clasp a rare and radiant maiden, whom the angels named Lenore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. 
Be that word our sign of parting, bird or fiend, I shrieked up starting. Get thee back into the tempest and the night's plutonian shore. Leave no black plume as a token of that lie thy soul has spoken. Leave thy loneliness unbroken. Quit the bust above my door. Take thy beak from out my heart and take thy form from off my door. Quoth the raven. Nevermore. And the raven, never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting on the pallid bust of Pallas, just above my chamber door. And his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming. And the lamplight o'er him streaming throws his shadow on the floor. And my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted nevermore. The raven, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Most of us find that, uh, that poem entertaining. Uh, ling uh, English professors are normally not so sanguine. Uh, criticisms include contrived melodramatic atmosphere. Another one said it's, uh, wrote, it's frequently banal diction and rhyming. One critic simply said, unsuccessful. <laughs> I guess there's no figuring what constitutes good taste. That is romanticism because it's all going on inside. It's all about plumbing the emotions. Um, and uh, before we return to other things, I think it's important to realize that Romanticism is not simply about the arts and literature. One of the uh, strongest criticisms of uh, Romanticism, or, and particularly of Rousseau, was named Irving Babbitt. And in uh, 1919, he uh, wrote the following. And guess what? I have five senses. Quote, the fundamental thing in Rousseau is not that humans are naturally good, but they are naturally neutral. Original sin is now gone. Proof, because we're all made from nature. There is no longer an internal human struggle between good and evil because we no longer need to challenge who we are as a person because nature made us this way. The beautiful soul this is a quote, does the right thing not as a result of effort. Oh, this is just, just leading. Oh, this is so nice. <laughs> not as a result of, of, uh, of effort, but spontaneously, unconsciously, and almost inevitably. We don't have to work for this. Last, last sentence. In fact, the beautiful soul can scarcely be said to be a voluntary agent at all. Nature acts in him and for him, thus minimizing moral struggle, deliberation, and choice. How is that playing in the 21st century? Um, and of course, this romanticism continues in the United States uh, and it leads directly to Walt Whitman. Now, um, Waltman, uh, Whitman, whose uh, mantra in the opening uh, uh, lines of leaves of grass reads, what? Somebody's got to know. What's the, what are the first line in the later editions? There were nine, I think nine different renditions of leaves of grass that were published over the years. You can't look at the computer. No, that's water. Yeah. I'm sorry, Jerry, I thought you were going to get the computer. Um, I celebrate myself and I sing myself. That's, in effect, the measure of the whole book. It's celebrating who you are as a natural being. Now, in a previous uh, appearance at uh, the campus here, I'd done some passages from uh, Whitman and then, and then put my own interpretation on those, which got some pretty good laughter. But I'll spare you uh, that and just tell you um, a little story that popped in my mind when I remember thinking about Whitman. Um, and it's about when I went to see a movie 12, 15 years ago. It was prob I don't go to movies. I don't like to sit in the theater. 
um, for a couple of reasons. One is uh, you're, you're subjected to 15 or 20 minutes of advertisements. And then in this case, as was true to form, there was a little monster about seven years old behind me kicking my seat until I turned around and gave him a look. And I don't know what he looked that saw that look as, but he quit, which was good. His mother was there or somebody was there. I don't know. Anyway, but one of, the, one of the ads knocked me over. I mean, imagine the full screen. It was probably a Star Wars thing because I wanted to see the big, what the, how they were going to do it in the big screen. So I'm sitting there and they're advertising Peter Pan, I think it was. Or there's now there's a Tinkerbell series that goes with it. Anyway, so there's, there's, they have some clips from the movie on the thing. And, and Tinkerbell is a truculent little, vicious little thing. And she's stand, sitting, and here's the whole screen, okay? I mean, as wide as this room. And right smack in the middle of it, the only thing you see is her face with screwed up tight, and she screams at whoever she's talking to, don't judge me. And it was like a wave came over me and I thought, well, Whitman has is, Whitman is triumphed. If we can't hold society to some standard, we're, anyway, enough uh, for Whitman. And I'm gonna wrap up this, this uh, topic of romanticism. But I believe we've reached a cultural point, and me after having studied polysyllabic words in institutions of higher education for many years, I term this what we've got now, don't panic, there'll be no test on this, solipsistic nihilism. What in the heck is that? Solipsism in philosophy is the theory that the self can be aware of nothing but its own experiences and mental states. The only truth is inside. Nihilism, of course, is the denial of any basis for knowledge of truth. And I think we have to ask if the 1896 warnings of a professor, George Santayana, who was quite well respected during his life, uh, might bear some re-examination when he warned that Whitman was, quote, a poet of barbarism who regards his passions as their own excuse for being, who does not domesticate them either by understanding their cause or conceiving their ideal goal. We may all, I think, want to think about that quote the next time we hear of our ever too common mass shooting.